Good morning, everybody. Great to see you. Welcome back. Congratulations, you've made it. Morning. You've made it to the final day of Survivor. No, oh, sorry, this is not Survivor. This is. This is the Investor Musician Peak Performance Challenge, day five. It's Friday morning. Uh, we are very excited to to bring all of this uh, work that we've been doing this week together. And I'm really excited to find out how much progress you've made across the week. We've seen a lot of really awesome videos in the uh, in the Facebook community, uh, a lot of great playing. Uh, you sent us some fantastic videos by email and we've got a lot of comments back for you for those and uh, we hope that's been helpful. Uh, we've covered a lot of stuff this week. It's an amazing amount of content. Uh, so. For those of you who are joining us, you know, maybe for the first time today or you've missed a few days, uh, take the time to, to go over the videos uh, for the rest of the week and put all this together. Um, if you are looking at this as a, um, you know, as a block, if you're starting with day one and you're going to, in five hours, go through to day five, that's fine too. Um, but you know, take the time to go through these steps and see how each one of the of the uh, days that we've worked on will help to contribute to make you a more complete musician and and a better player. Uh, for one final time, uh, my name is Andrew. Uh, I'm the principal horn of the Los Angeles Philharmonic and uh, horn professor at Colburn, and uh, also I teach at the Aspen uh, Music Festival and School in the summer. Uh, is a little bit about what I what I've gotten up to. Um, I've had a m number of jobs in orchestras all over the world, and uh, played in a bunch of really cool movies, and taught in some uh, very exciting places. So I'm very excited to be able to you know to use this platform to be able to connect with so many people around the world, and uh, and to work with you uh, individually and in this environment as a group and share our uh, collective knowledge. This is our team at Invested Musician for this project. Rupal, of course, is the CEO of the company and uh, runs Invested Musician. Uh, and the rest of our team do an amazing job behind the scenes. And we're very proud that we've been able to involve, uh, you know, the, the music community during the time of COVID and, uh, and work with some really fantastic people uh, and to help them develop their skill set and their careers, not only on a music side, but from the administrative point of view as well. So uh, Rupal. Good morning. Good morning. Yes. I mean, I think you summed it up perfectly. Don't have anything else to add. Okay. Great. We've got a lot of stuff to get through this morning, so I'm going to keep moving. Uh, this is a quick look into our website. If you want more information about Investor Musician, please check out uh, www.investormusician.com, if I can say that properly. Uh, and also check out the uh, Check out the YouTube channel. There's a, all of the video that we've done in these free sessions across uh, the last couple of years, warm-up sessions, technique classes. I've got a bunch of videos that are gonna help you improve your playing and improve your musicality. We, we tackle some excerpts, we tackle some uh, exercises and etudes, lots of different ideas. Uh, there's even a bit of playing there. There's, a, there's quite a nice recording of, uh, of uh, Strauss' first concerto. Uh, with me playing in Mexico and and the most recent big recording actually is uh, the Bruckner 7 from that same concert. Uh, I still look back on that and think how did I get through playing Strauss 1 in the first half and Bruckner 7 in the second half but um, it happened and the video's there so check it out. Um, fantastic orchestra down there in Mexico City. Uh, so yeah, check out our YouTube channel. There's a lot of information and we we'll always love to hear from you on email and uh, through Messenger as well. Uh, if you've if you've got any ideas for us, if you've got any thoughts, or if we can help in any way. Okay, so what have we been doing this week? If you have been on another planet for the last four days and now you are just joining us, I know this is not the case with Fred Brownlee. Fred is uh, is uh, one of our alum, actually in our current course at the moment. Fred is here every day and has put up some terrific recordings. Good morning, Fred. Uh, so for those of you who haven't been here, this is I'm just going to put all this together in a nutshell, what we've been working on. So the overarching idea of, of this uh, peak performance challenge is to understand the three pillars of what we, what we need as musicians. So there's the technical side or the physical side of our playing, the musical side, understanding the context, understanding the style, how to get into that 
context how to get the character of the music and how to how to immerse ourselves in in the musical side of our playing uh, and then the mental side how once we've worked on the technical and the musical how do we release that how do we how do we get that from the practice room into the stage and this is what we're going to talk a little bit about today uh, we uh, we talked about this yesterday in terms of awareness but uh, we're going to see if we can extend on that a little bit in today's session the foundation, so this is the technical side. This is what we talked about on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, the technical side of our playing, we want to always come back and ask ourselves the question when we're doing something, uh, when we're building our technique, when we're practicing a technique, exercise or an etude, is my mechanism simple, natural and repeatable? Is what I'm doing something that I'm going to be able to do when I'm under pressure or is it only, am I only able to do it when I'm in the comfort of my own home without any stress and I'm feeling good? I want to be making sure that the ingredients of my playing that I put in, I can do when I'm under the most amount of pressure. When I'm playing a concerto on Walt Disney Concert Hall, I want those things to be nice and stable, that I feel comfortable, that I know what's going to happen. I don't want to have something that I, you know, I need a perfect night for things to work. Because that really, really happens. And it really happens on auditions as well. So is my mechanism, is what I'm putting in place simple, natural and repeatable? So we talked about the building blocks of our playing. So this is for a brass player or a wind player. So everything starts with the air. And then from there we can add these extra blocks. So we add from, from the air we can add the lips. So we can go to just making sound with the buzzing or just without articulation into the instrument, even if that's, if that's a flute, a clarinet, trombone, all the same. So as a horn player, just focus, focusing on releasing the air, the same feeling of the airstream that I would put onto my fingers into the mouthpiece. And then we can also couple the air with the articulation, with the tongue. So very simply, I just flip the mouthpiece around, or you can use a straw, just to match that feeling of the air and having the tongue just cutting through the air. And then from there, then I can add all three together. Or I can put it into the instrument. Now the two other elements that we, we talked about in our technique session, <clears throat> or our te technique side of the, of the challenge, was movement and coordination. So we have movement. And then coordination, coordination with our fingers. And also coordination with the articulation. So we can do that without our fingers. So in this case, I'm coordinating the change of the notes with the strike of my articulation. And then, in addition to that, I can add fingering. So keep in mind, <clears throat> and for you guys, for you, for you brass players out there, and actually this applies for any wind instrument and for the strings as well. Um, when we miss notes or when notes don't speak cleanly or when things that you know don't sound as pristine as you would like we often think that it's it's one element it's like oh i you know my embouchure wasn't in the right place or my finger wasn't in the right place on the string this can be the case but i would say in the majority of cases it's simply that we are not coordinated it's simply that the tongue is not coordinating with the airstream, coordinating with the change of the note. So it might be the change of your finger might not be coordinating with the change of your tongue. Or your embouchure might move to a new note, but the tongue doesn't coordinate with that. So this is where, if we look at the five ways of success, 
practice method and we take the first one which is way too little if we practice things way too slowly we're going to be able to work on that coordination we're going to be able to make sure that things line up at a nice slow tempo and then carry that through the different speeds that we will be practicing at so so for the five ways for success we talked about playing something and practicing something way too little so that might be way too soft it might be way too slow you get my idea with this right and so then the next one is way it's just too little so not quite to the tempo that we want but a little bit to whatever we choose of the element and then just right the perfect goldilocks tempo for example and then too much and way too much and when we get to the stage where we're really confident at being able to play a piece or an excerpt or an or an exercise in those five ways chances are we know it pretty well and this is very important in auditions because what tends to happen is conductors or panels or committees will ask you to play things in a variety of ways. If you've only learned it just the right way that you want to play it and they ask for something different, it's going to feel uncomfortable in the audition. So this helps us to be prepared for all these inevitabilities. Also when conductors ask us to change something in a concert or hopefully not in a concert in rehearsal. Okay, and then we title the technique together. So we talked about establishing the elements away from the instrument, executing them into the instrument with simple drills, simple exercises, expanding them through more challenging exercises, applying those skills to studies and etudes, and then delivering them into excerpts and pieces. So that we're really building, so we, we talk a lot about structure, obviously. You know, we've got three pillars, we've got foundation, the, you know, the basis of what we do. So this is, we, we wanna make sure that we're building things in a sustainable, uh, and simple and natural and repeatable way. Okay. Do we have any any comments about uh, your experience this week on the technical side? Put them in the chat or raise your hand or just scream, whichever you prefer. That's what my kids would do. They would just start yelling, but that's fine. Yeah, what improvements, put in the chat, what improvements have you found on a technical side you've made this week? What is the, what is the, the main takeaway or something that you've discovered you can change in your playing that's going to that's gonna really help you moving forward? Andrew? Yeah. I have yeah. some. So um, I, my setup improved a lot. And I think I was sort of like in a period in my playing where it was kind of changing for the better. But this week was so accelerated because of being able to isolate everything away from the instrument. And, and then with the singing and um, like solfeging and all of, <clears throat> all of that, I've done that my whole, almost my whole like um, <clears throat> sort of life with the trumpet, but it integrated in a much more effective way. So that setup and um, singing just became so much more kind of connected and linked. And I'm really surprised at how one week, you know, things have changed so much. So I really appreciate this course. Fantastic. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, the, the, thing, the thing is that, you know, what, what I discovered in my playing is I, I used to practice in a very random way. And, and I, I, was, I was being jerked to whatever was the, you know, the most urgent thing that I needed to address. Uh, and and that would tend to work okay, like you know. But I would I would be putting out spot fires every week, like oh this week I need to practice this, so I'm going to practice this sort of technique, and and I'm going to you know address this piece, and this is what I'm going to focus on. And it's it's what we talk about in in um, you know discussing practice. Um, it's block practice. I would I would do block practice where I would learn something, and I would practice three hours on basically one or two things. And I would get that up, but then I would come back to it in a week's time, having left it for a week, and I couldn't play it because because of the way that you know we recall in our memory. And when I started realizing that if I just if I just organize my practice in a, in a more methodical way, and if I if I understood how I was building my playing, everything would get better. And so this idea of like if if my in if my entire you know playing structure gradually continues to improve every piece that I play will get better 
And so if we can, if we can approach our practice in this way, in this organized way with good structure, uh, all of the information that we've received over the years it can plug into that and we're gonna to continue to grow and improve as we go. So great, I'm glad that uh, that's been helpful, Ganesh. Awesome. Chicago practice in a more organized way and awareness in practice is great. Awesome, we're gonna talk about awareness in a second. Technique is so much easier, awesome, great. Before this week I just practiced the material I needed to learn. Ah, Michael, you're just like me. <laughs> <laughs> you practice how I used to practice, it's great. This week made me think about how to improve how I think and how to approach practice with specific goals for each practice session. Yeah, terrific. And it's something we talk a lot about in the summer program is, is goal setting. Goal setting and understanding that there are different types of goals um, and, and the goals will help feed our, our ability to create structure and that structure will help us to be able to practice better and that will lead us to much quicker improvement and raise the ceiling of our ability. Okay. So on the third day, I think Wednesday, yeah, Wednesday we talked about the musical side of things. So the character, how, whenever we play anything, we have to play it with character. What is the character of the piece you're playing? What is the character of the excerpt? What is the character of a study? We can change the character of any study. Just because it's coprash and it looks like a bunch of scales doesn't mean that you have to play it in a way that is like a midi. Right? Anyone guilty of doing that? Um, but what happens is what I do now is if I have a coprash etude and we've got a Mozart concerto coming up or um, a Strauss tone poem, I want to try and transfer my mind into that character and play that pretty dry etude in the character of the music that I'm practicing and see if I can do it. If I can do it for, a, you know, for an etude that's basically scales and arpeggios, then when I bring it to actually the real music, then it's going to be a lot easier. We talked about listening to, listening to recordings and thinking about what you'd like about particular recordings. So critically listening to, to, the, uh, to the recordings you have, what you like and what you don't like. Take what you like put it into your own playing. And we, we want to develop our own character, our own opinion for the piece based on the array of recordings that we listen to or the performances that we listen to. And if you can't quite get in touch with that, then just copy one of them, mimic that. And this links into what we talked about yesterday. We talked about the maestro and the singer method. So singing through your piece, conducting it, blowing it through a straw or the instrument or the mouthpiece or bowing it, you can air bow it or you can play it on the instrument on, on open strings. Playing the fingerings on the instrument as you're, as you're singing it, as you're blowing it. Combine those things and then put it all together with your playing. It's gonna give you much more connection to the musical side of what you wanna do and and what it does without us really thinking about it is it moves us from our left brain, which is the technical side where we're working on making sure that we're doing all the right elements. It moves us into the right brain, which is the musical side, the emotional side, uh, the more creative side of our brain. So creating awareness in the practice room, really, really important to get the most out of our practice. We wanna create more awareness of when we're being distracted when we're checking our phone, <laughs> when we're thinking about checking our phone, when we're wondering where our phone is. All of these things are not helpful to your practice session. And then the awareness of when we're trying to develop technical elements. So what are the ingredients that I'm putting in rather than, geez, I hope I can just get these notes out. So that we're committing to building good habits in our practice and being aware of making sure that we're executing those habits. And then identifying the cause for when we make a mistake. Remembering that it's not always the moment that you make the mistake that is the cause of that mistake. It may have happened right at the beginning of the phrase when you took a really bad breath. Or when you had really, you know, if you're a violinist, you had a lot of tension in your, in your right hand, but you got the first entrance right. The first note came out, but then later on, the bow change was very stiff and very clunky. 
if we can be aware of where we where these issues where the errors are created then we can fix them and remember the overarching thing of awareness is unless we are aware of something we can't change it and we can't actively put it into habit it just becomes chance and what we tend to do as musicians in the practice room is we repeat things over and over and over without being aware of what habits we're building and we build some pretty dodgy habits and then we get into performance and those habits break down because they're not good habits they're not something that is simple natural and repeatable so all of this stuff ties together if we can think simple natural and repeatable making sure we're putting that into our practice making sure we're making that connection and we need to we need awareness to be able to make sure that that is happening does that make sense yeah. okay and we move to <clears throat> awareness on stage so the voice in our head did anyone uh, anyone find a name for their voice in their head? Or did anyone discover the voice in their head overnight? Dennis, what's your voice? I can see that I can see that you, you have a voice in your head, I can tell. No? <laughs> Daniel Omer has Loki in his head. There you go. Put in the chat who your voice is in your head that distracts you. I was going to mention that it it just depends on where you are in the day. Sometimes, you, as you say, that we have multiple elements in our life outside the practice and performance area. And it just depends on how you allow yourself to have that bump up against where you're trying to get to. So, um, actually, I'm highly amused um, for all of the weeks that we've spent together, um, or at least I've spent watching you. So, keep going. It's truly a wonderful thing. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Yeah, and, and so one of the things we talked about in terms of awareness is taking the time, this is sort of going back a, a slide, but taking the time to just get yourself focused before you go into the practice room. So that you're not in the practice room, you sit down and get all your stuff together. Okay, now what music am I playing? And then, okay, now I'm going to go. Because you're guaranteed that you will kick back into what you were doing in the rest of your life in that moment. So just before you walk in the practice room, take a few seconds, take a minute to just focus on what you want to achieve from that practice session. Get in the right mindset for how you want to use that time. And remember, <clears throat> if, you, if you're not using your time in your practice room effectively, Go to the golf course, <laughs> go to the pub, have a good time, right? So get yourself organized, get yourself focused before you go into the room, you'll make the most out of your practice time and then you'll feel really good about yourself and then you can go to the golf course. I like Austin's one, Karen, that's good. So as we know, mine is Bob. There's a, there's a YouTube video where Sarah Willis and I are doing a masterclass at Colburn and uh, we had a blow up a Stormtrooper. It was around the time where we were recording, we had recorded the first Star Wars movie in, in LA. Um, and we had, uh, actually maybe the, that, one, that movie was coming out or the next one was coming out, I can't remember. Um, so we had this huge blow up Stormtrooper doll and that was Bob. So if you imagine, if you want to check that out, you'll see, you'll see it on Sarah Willis's um, YouTube channel. Um, it's actually a really good masterclass. We sort of tag team the students for that from uh, all different schools in Los Angeles. And it was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, Bob gets a bit of a workout. Bob gets to dance with Sarah Willis. There you go. Pretty good. Doug Hall's got Obi-Wan. Fair enough. Maybe Darth Vader. Not sure. Great. Okay. So as well as the voice, being aware of when we make mistakes, both the voice and making mistakes are, are, are going to distract us. They're going to take us away from our focus. So the important thing is that we acknowledge that. We acknowledge, yeah, okay, this is happening. And then get back into the focus of you know what, what our task is, which is to stay with the music and, and keep moving forward. Be aware when you create tension. This often happens before performance. And then try to make sure that 
and we talk a lot about this in the, in the summer course, tools to release the tension, tools to, to release your anxiety. So use, use the tools that you have to, when you're aware of that you're feeling uptight, you're feeling stressed, you're feeling nervous, use those tools whenever you feel it. Don't wait for the moment just before you play a solo to then go, okay, now I'm gonna go through my, my calm routine because it's probably too late. And then be aware of, of how being nervous affects our breathing. Remember I talked about I'm stabbing myself in the side of my ribs before, before a concert or when I'm nervous? This is to remind me that I want to get back to simple, natural, and repeatable. This is my trigger for getting to really good breathing. Because that is the number one thing for most of us as wind and brass players that we will reduce, that will automatically reduce when we get nervous. We shrink, the breathing shrinks, our sound shrinks, we feel more nervous, right? So if we can expand our breathing, then we're going to feel more confident by nature. So today is about letting it go and trusting it. Look at all the work that we've done. It's amazing. Very cool. <clears throat> so, yesterday we had a little assignment, uh, practicing your piece or exit five times and note what you're distracted by. Put in the chat what you discovered overnight. And the difference between when you recorded the piece and when you practiced it and then also put in who your uh, who your favourite player was that you impersonated. I'd love to hear from you about you know what you found through this experiment through this process. I can tell the story for myself uh, that I played a Mozart concerto several years ago with the LA Phil. And uh, I was feeling particularly edgy on that night. I can't imagine why you would feel nervous playing a concerto on the stage of Walt Disney Concert Hall with the Los Angeles Philharmonic. Should be a piece of cake, right? Um, but no, apparently it's not. Um, and I was feeling pretty edgy. Um, <clears throat> and I could not get into, into a mindset where I felt confident. Anyone ever felt that before a concert? Where you just can't, you just feel like defensive and you feel like, I'm just, I don't know, I just, I just feel really like this is not going to work. So I have a set of tools that I use to get myself through that. And I'd gotten through all of them and I still hadn't gotten anywhere. I was still feeling like, oh my God, why am I, I'm such a fraud. Why am I playing, I shouldn't be playing concerto with the LA Phil. Like, what is this? Like, I'm some, this little guy from Australia. I have no right to be doing this. This is totally normal, by the way. Totally normal for your brain to do this to yourself, right? So if you, if you, if you find this in before you play a concert, before you play a chamber music concert or a recital or you know, concerto with the LA Phil, <clears throat> first thing to do is acknowledge that it's actually fine. It's actually normal. It's just your brain's way of like trying to defend itself. And and what is it? What is it telling your body? Well, you've got all this adrenaline going through your body, and adrenaline is designed to help you with the fight or flight mechanism, right? So, you know, when we were back in the day with saber-toothed tigers and, you know, living in a cave, um, adrenaline was very helpful if you had to outrun a tiger. Unfortunately for us, it's not very useful because we're sitting on stage. You can't run anywhere, but your brain doesn't know that. So your brain doesn't know the difference also between playing a concert or staring down a lion. Doesn't care. Your nervous reaction doesn't care. They're both life-threatening events as far as it's concerned. So you're about to go into a life-threatening event. What is the reaction of your brain and your subconscious? To run away. It wants to get you out of there. So my brain is saying to me when I'm backstage in my dressing room waiting to go and play Mozart 4, it's like, you know, we can still get out of this. Still, you know, it's just like, and so it's sending these messages. Yeah, you know, you know, you don't feel comfortable. You're gonna screw this up. Maybe, maybe there's another option. I don't want to go through this, right? So it's all totally normal. All that we need is tools to be able to move past it. And my go-to tool, if I get into that situation, is impersonation. I will become 
either, I mean, the first step is to become a superhuman version of myself. Like I become like a superhero, Andrew. Put my cape on, off I go. Um, but if that doesn't work, then I just become Stefan Dorr. I just impersonate Stefan Dorr. And, I, and I, I've practiced this. I've practiced playing like Stefan Dorr as best I think I can, right? And so for me, that particular night, the first two minutes of Mozart were not played by Andrew Bain. They were played by Stefan Dorr. They just happened to look, you know, Stefan Dorr doesn't have a beard. That's the, that, was, that was the thing. Right? And it actually went great. And then after two minutes, I felt, oh, okay. This is okay. I can play. And I could go back to my normal, you know, me presenting. But it's important to have tools. If we don't have any tools, we're going to freak out. And then the other part of the fight or flight is freeze. Fight, flight, or freeze. And what happens to a lot of us is when we're on stage and we get nervous, is we can't run away, we can't fight it, so we just freeze. And we get stuck on stage and we don't end up doing anything. And this has happened to me many times in auditions. So having tools to overcome that is, the, is really the important thing. We're not going to be able to change it. And fighting against it is not going to help us. Trying to trying to think, oh no, this isn't going to happen. I'm going to I'm going to be able to. No, it's totally normal. It happens to everybody. Whether you're in the LA Phil or whether you're in the Santa Monica Symphony. Dry mouth is a is a is a thing, Eric. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Put them in the chat, and uh, if you know, or, or yell them out. Go for it. Okay. So today I want to just touch on a little bit to the performance mindset. How do we, you know, how do we want to get into performance? This, this is I'm giving you an insight into into my mindset when I when I'm performing. And one of the most important things that we have to remember when we go into performance, and when at the end of this week when you are going to, you know, record your final recording for yourself to see how far you've come, is trust the work that you've done. You, When you're on the stage performing your recital or performing your audition, you can't do any more work. You can't do, you can't improve your technique at that point. Your brain thinks you can. Your brain's like, we, we can, we really need to go back to this, you know, make sure I'm, I'm working on this thing. It wants to, it wants to go back to that comfort zone of the practice room. But we simply have to trust the work that we've done and accept the technical level that we're at and focus on our musical image, the one that we created when we were conducting or singing. And then this is really hard. We have to, after we've trusted ourselves, trust and, and committing to it link together, we just have to commit to the musical image and go for it. There is nothing more that you can do at this moment. Sure, the moment you walk off stage, you can go back in the practice room and work on the stuff that you know you need to work on. But in that moment, commit to what, what you want as a musical image, commit to that character and go for it. And we talked about in my little story about being a superhero. So be your own superhero, create a persona for yourself that is confident, that is, that is, that you feel as though, yeah, I'm in touch with that. I, I know I can do that. And if you can't, be someone else. And remember that when, that, that mistakes will happen. We played Fidelio last night. It was amazing. One of the most amazing uh, experiences, I think, that I've had in my career um incredible cast of of singers the singers are phenomenal the orchestra sounds amazing gustavo has a you know a great affinity to you know to beethoven and to you know the, the art of opera and and just bringing people together but to see the connection of of the the singers with the with the deaf actors and the deaf chorus that were that were performing last night and just how much it meant to to everyone to be involved in that process was really 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 uh, touching and amazing and it was it was an incredibly emotional uh, evening so if anyone is in the los angeles area 
uh, I would really encourage you to, to see if you can get a ticket tonight, Friday night uh, or Saturday night. There are two more performances. Um, it sounds amazing. Visually, it's incredible. And uh, it gives an incredible insight into the world of, the, of, of, of not being able to hear. We actually, we actually get to experience that as well. And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's very, very special. And the good thing is it's only two and a half hours. So for opera, it's like a walk in the park. <laughs> Most operas, you're sitting around for three, three and a half hours. So, um, unless, of course, it's the ring, in which case you're there forever. And you sh that's, that's, you know, that's why you're not in this particular meeting at the moment, because you're listening to Goethe Dameron from last week. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the point is, over a two and a half hour opera, there are going to be mistakes. Of course, I would love to admit that I didn't make a mistake last night, but that would be a lie. I made a bunch of mistakes. Over two and a half hours, that's going to happen. The important thing is that I stick to the plan. I continue to trust myself. I continue to focus on the musical image, and I continue to commit to going for it, and I move on straight away after the mistakes so that I have good recovery. There's a question for you. What do great performers all have in common? All have their own voice, personality, great. Confidence. They stay in the flow, terrific, efficiency, yeah. Oh, I have a feeling Daniel may have seen this question before. <laughs> Great. Great actors, yeah. They like, yeah. Fantastic. Okay, a lot of great answers there. Really, really good. Yeah, these are all absolutely fantastic. So there's one thing that, that we didn't that we didn't um, put in the chat. They all start well. They all start well. When was the last time you heard a great performer? destroy the beginning of a concerto. It doesn't happen. Why? Why doesn't it happen? It doesn't happen because they are focused. They have a plan before going on stage. They have a clarity of mind. They trust their work and they go for it right off the bat. So their preparation is, is very good, but they are focused and they're ready to go right from the beginning. The other main trait of great performance it's not that they get a lot of right notes. It's not that they are, you know, they they move you because some great performers don't move you. It's it, they don't make that connection. That's totally fine. They move other people. But Daniel, a couple of people actually mentioned this, but Daniel said this very nice. They all recover gracefully from mistakes and stay focused on the music. So the two things, the two big things, when you think about this, when you're next listening to a great performance, what makes a great performer, a great orchestra, a great soloist, great conductor? They all start well, they're focused at the beginning, and they stay in the moment and they recover from mistakes. And the recovery thing to me is the most important thing in auditions. When we're talking about auditions, I get very nervous when a candidate doesn't make any mistakes. Not because it's a bad thing, because I want to I want to find out how they react when they do make a mistake. Because I've played with a lot of people and I've played with a lot of great musicians and they all make mistakes. So I know that mistake is coming. I just want to find out how they're going to react after they make that mistake. Are they going to panic? Are they going to, is it going to unravel? Are they going to try and do something? When, think about this, right? You make a mistake and you think, oh, now I've got to make up for the mistake. I've got to do something special. 
right? And then think, then they push them out, push themselves outside of the boundaries of what's comfortable, and then it gets even worse. So I want to find that out. So what's really interesting in an audition is when someone makes a mistake, how they react, and this gives a lot of feedback to the committee. So if you can focus on your your or trusting your work and staying in the moment when you're performing and when you're in an audition and getting back on track after you make a mistake using the tools we've talked about then you're going to be in good shape it's no one has ever gotten kicked out of an audition for making a mistake despite what people may write in blogs and what people think it doesn't happen it doesn't exist no one has ever gotten eliminated because of a mistake. There's a bunch of other reasons why they might got eliminated, but making a mistake isn't one of them. So if you blip a note, if you, you miss a finger, you play a wrong note, it's not a problem. Get back on the track. Keep committing to your musical picture. Trust yourself. Okay, this is a question we asked ourselves at the beginning of the session. Uh, on Monday. How would your career accelerate if you could max out your potential? So you've had an insight over this last week about how much improvement you can make in five days. It's pretty exciting. It's pretty exciting when you have the support around you, when you have tools to be able to put things in place, when you free yourself up and allow yourself to experiment in your practice, and then you can bring it into an environment where you can confirm, oh yeah, I tried this, and this didn't work, have you got another idea? This is why we created Investor Musician. This is why we want to put on these, these sessions. And this is why we have a summer program for people who want to extend these skills and have more skills and have more support around you so that you can actually really take your playing to a totally different level. So it's all about identifying what your potential is and this is the one thing that I think in my career that I've, I've done really well, is identifying that the, the, the biggest help to my career is understanding how I can raise my ceiling. The higher my ceiling or my potential of playing is, the more chance I've got of playing at a high level consistently, the more chance I've got of building my career and continuing to grow. As a student, I was not good. I was like a middle of the pack horn player in my early 20s. But what I what I discovered was yeah and, and I I could I was working my backside off like I I would practice a lot I would I just wasn't practicing the right way. Um I and I didn't have the information that I that I needed and I didn't have the structure that I needed and I didn't understand how to learn. And so I spent a lot of time trying to figure that out. And what I realized was if I, if my potential, if I can move my ceiling to, if my best performance is like off the charts, amazing, then if I perform at 80% of that, I'm still way ahead of the game. I don't need to be performing at 100% and I never do. And neither does, and this is the other thing, <laughs> great performance is, and there's a, there's a really cool uh, class in the, in the uh, there's an online thing you can get called masterclass. Has anyone seen that? You can buy these things, and there's one with Perlman, and Perlman talks about, you know, his great performances and his, you know, level, and he says on most nights where his wife listens to most of the concerts, she said, most nights where he, you know, where she comes back and says yeah, that was really, really great, he reckons that's about ninety percent for him, ninety percent of his best performance, and that's about where we want to be. So if we work on maxing out our potential in continuing to raise the ceiling so that we don't need to play, don't need to do auditions at, you know, have a great day for an audition. I can do an audition tomorrow and have a pretty average day and I'm going to have a chance because my ceiling is well above what I need for that particular audition or that job. So as we know, auditions and performing opportunities are opening up like crazy at the moment. There's more auditions than ever. There's more people are putting on concerts, they're trying to catch up from, you know, having 12 months of being locked down or 18 months. But there's a lot more competition for this as well, right? Because everyone's been sitting at home, they're like, everyone's clamoring for the gigs. So it's now at a situation where contractors and orchestras are actually in a position where there's sort of a bit of a glut of, you know, there's a lot of concerts, but they have, a, they have an opportunity to hire, you know, a different, scope of people than before. 
we want to be at the front of that list. We want to have our playing and our preparation at a level where we're going to be at the forefront of contractors' minds. We're going to be at, you know, at the forefront of personnel managers' minds. So not only is the playing side important for us in this area and that we continue to grow our playing, that's, that's an obvious thing. And we want to, again, make sure that if we're focusing on raising our ceiling, we will continue to improve and continue to have growth. But we need structure for that. We need to be able to understand how to practice really well. But also building relationships, building connections with the people who are going to hire us is really, really important. And so in the summer program, what we do is we, we're connecting these things. And Ripple has a, has a background as an MBA and in business. This is all that people go to business school for. <laughs> I think I'm safe in saying that, Ripple. Really. Uh, it's all about the connections. It's all about building relationships. It's all about networking. Now, it's for musicians, that's a cringy thing. We, we're like, oh, I don't want to do networking. I don't want to... But, but it's actually just what we're doing anyway. We just can do it more efficiently and in a more productive level. So we want to think about and just challenge yourself to think about how will you be in position to take advantage of all of these gigs that come back in the fall, all these auditions that are coming up. Are you gonna be prepared? Are you gonna feel going into that audition room? Because for me, preparation is confidence, right? So if I'm prepared, if, I've, if I feel as though, yep, I've, I've, my, my technical playing is at a super high level, musically I've got a great plan for every excerpt, I'm super clear on exactly how I hear that excerpt, how I hear the orchestra around me, exactly how I'm gonna enter into each excerpt. And if I feel as though I've got a really strong mental game and I'm making the connections with the, with the contractors, I'm gonna feel pretty confident in, my, in myself, in my environment, that I will be able to take full advantage of all of these opportunities that, that are sitting out there at the moment. And I'll also be able to source opportunities that I don't even know about. I'll be able to find them too. Doug, good morning. I just had one comment. Um, to help with auditions, I like to have what I call a pre-shot routine. So you have a little bit of the orchestra before your excerpt. Right. And, and so that puts you into the mode of what I call the zone. Terrific. Yeah, and, and this is something we actually cover a lot in our audition preparation part of the of the summer course is actually individually going through with you the excerpts and then how to how to build this exactly what Doug is saying, how to build this pre shot routine. Or how to build your move from sitting on stage turning the page, how to get from turning that page, seeing a new excerpt, to being able to deliver that at a really confident high level. And there are some really, really, really cool tools and very, very simple tools that you're going to be able to implement when you have this uh, opportunity in auditions. So I'm now at the stage where, and, and I do the same thing as, as Doug, I, I've, I create a little soundtrack leading into each excerpt. And it will vary. Sometimes, sometimes it will be what's going on in the orchestra. If you're playing Heldenleben at the beginning, you don't have a you don't have anything going on beforehand. So I need to create something in my mind that's gonna get me into this character and then feel confident going into each excerpt. Because one of the things that happens in auditions is that we hear people play a very high technical level, but musically everything sounds the same. So how can we make this shift to get into Mozart, get into Haydn, get into, and then change into Bruckner, change into Mahler, change to Strauss? But the pre-shot routine that Doug's talking about is, uh, is a really fantastic idea. It's great. So you guys have made huge progress, hopefully. Show of hands, who's made huge progress this week? Awesome. That's great. Yeah, terrific. Uh, so you made huge progress on one piece this week. I mean, what we're talking about is an overall thing, but we fo our focus has been on one piece. So that's... The first step. This is this is what we've we've got a little bit of a template 
for, for how we can do this, but we need to flesh this out. We need to be able to put this into a performance that lasts for an hour, potentially, or an audition that happens over three rounds, or an audition that happens over 10, 15, 20 minutes sometimes. Um, a recital that deals with various repertoire endurance things. Uh, and also, like what we discovered this week is that we st- with awareness, we're starting to identify what are the technical areas I really need to address? What are the things that are working? What are the things that are not working? And then how can I put all this together now that we see like, oh, there's all these elements that I can work on, but I've only got 24 hours in a day and I have to do a whole bunch of stuff. How can we efficiently set up practice time? How can we build a practice schedule that is going to cover everything, help us improve as quickly as we can and incorporate all these elements in, into our playing so that we can keep growing and uh, be prepared and feel confident when the opportunities come up. So this is just a little bit about our background and you've probably picked this up over the last five days. I know what it's like to be in the position of needing to get better because that was my early 20s and I was like, I had no idea. And the reason that we've created this is because we want to provide this support and help for people who are in this situation where it's like, I, I, I'm working like crazy, I'm working as hard as I can, I'm practicing as much as I can, but I, I'm only making this tiny incremental improvement or I don't feel as though I'm making the breakthrough that I want to or there are certain parts of what I'm doing that, are, that I'm just struggling with. So I've been there, I know, I know exactly that pain, and I've made all of the mistakes. I've practiced three hours in a sitting, I've practiced you know, in front of the television, uh, I've practiced you know, in front of my phone, and not just when my phone was a metronome. Um, all of the mistakes that we've made, and, and, and I've also practiced now in a way that I actually like, wow, this doesn't feel like I should be making a lot of progress. But after the end of the week, I'm like, wow, well, this is amazing. I, I can learn this piece. So for me, one of the things that keeps coming back to me is I, when I was preparing for the Melbourne Symphony audition, on that list was Schoenberg Chamber Symphony. And I'd never played the piece before. I'd never played the excerpt before. And I had two weeks to learn a huge chunk of Schoenberg Chamber Symphony, which is very, very challenging for the horn. So I had a plan. I had a plan and I'm like, I'm going to execute this plan. And if the plan doesn't get me there, in two weeks time, well then this just wasn't meant to be. Uh, And so I did six five minute practice sessions integrated with the rest of my practice throughout every day. And after seven days, I was like, wow, I'm actually like three days ahead of schedule because I've actually used the plan. I've, I've really focused on being in the moment and working as hard as I could on that piece for that five minute chunk. And I learned that piece so quickly and realized that, wow, actually, after each day, I didn't feel as I was making any progress. But as I came back to each session, each five minute session was about 30 minutes apart. I found I was retaining a lot more information. I was automatically improving when I woke up the next day, stuff was there. And so it didn't feel as though, I I didn't feel as though I was making as much progress if I'd have sat down and played it for 30 minutes. But what I was doing, I was building a wall with brick by brick. And that took off really, really quickly. So understanding how we learn, understanding how to put a great practice plan together and, and a great structure together is super important for us to be able to improve our whole level. So, special invitation, it's that time. Uh, We have a free masterclass uh, next Saturday. I said the other day or yesterday, it was gonna be on Monday, but we've actually kicked this out because um, I wanted wanted to give everyone who who may not even, may not be in the live sessions here, but also those of you who who have been here live for five days, I wanna give you like a, a period of time to implement what we've been talking about on other things in the next week. 
and to just refresh and, and have a look back at the videos and see you know what elements that we talked about are going to be helpful and try this out over the next week and see what, how it can apply to other parts of your playing other pieces how can you how can you can you choose another piece and uh, and apply what we've talked about to that and make the same improvement that you've made this week and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about all of these elements put all this together uh, in the masterclass on the 23rd of April at 9 a.m. Pacific. We made it. Well done, everybody. Awesome job. Uh, it has been a, a, a real pleasure and a treat for me to, uh, to spend the last five days working with everyone on this program. Uh, in our peak performance challenge what I would love for you to do is to uh, put put your final performance up in our in our IM community or write something write a put a post up in the IM community and just let us know how you went this week how things how things felt from the start of the week and what concepts that you found really exciting and that you're going to take away. What are your takeaways? Actually, put them in the chat now if you like. Um, but what? It, but, but it would be great for others who you know who are in the iron community to be able to see, you know, what what are the things that you found were really helpful that changed your outlook on your practice. And I, I'm really interested. I mean, in this in this uh, room at the moment, we have people who uh, have worked with us from day one in the program, and, and back way back in 2020. And have been working us a long time. I would guarantee that there is stuff that we talked about this week that we may have mentioned before, we may not have mentioned before, but will be helpful. Daniel, would that be safe to say? One hundred percent. These are solid, solid principles. Great. So you know, so there are people who've done done our you know courses before, and and will find benefit from this you know, definitely from these, these five days. And just even if it's just to refresh and to remind. And then there are people here who, you know, have never, never been in an investing musician session before and before this week. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, you got something out of the week, I hope, I think. And then there are people in the middle who've come back and they're like, oh, okay, yeah, this is pretty cool. So, so I would love to hear from you, love to hear your feedback on on uh, you know your development during the week, what you discovered, uh, and what you're going to put into your playing. Awesome. All right, Ripple, are you there? Ripple's probably not there. Okay, so uh, really hope we can see you uh, next Saturday, twenty third of April at nine a.m. There's Ripple. And uh, Ripple, have I missed anything? No, that that covers everything. It's been really fun and enjoyable this whole week. So I know it's been a lot. That's why Andrew recommended we push the masterclass a little bit so you guys can all digest and rest. And we will hopefully see you guys back next Saturday. Yeah, and if in the meantime, if you can't if you can't do without us, or you just want to hear me talk which is probably no one. Um, sit, please uh, go on the website and make, a, make a, uh, a consult with us. Come and have a chat. If, you, if you've got questions about what happened this week, if you're interested in, in joining us for the summer program, we're really excited about it. We, it's, it's, uh, we're going to really make sure that it's a very, very focused group of people, a very small number, and, and remembering that we've had people from in their 60s, from, their, from 16 to 60s. Uh, in the in the summer course, so we get a lot of questions like, "Oh, I don't think the I don't think the summer course is for me." If you want to improve, if you want to move your playing and your musicality and your level to to a new level, then the summer program is for you. If that's what your commitment is, and we would love to love to chat with you about you know how we can uh, how we can make that happen. Uh, but in the meantime, have a great week. Have a great weekend. Happy Easter, everybody, and. We'll see you all soon. Thanks. <laughs>